Hello, and welcome to Art History Talks. This is Molly Enholm, and today's artist is Rosalba Carriera. Today, we are going to delve into the story of one of the most popular of the Rococo artists who broke the mold in terms of the typical Rococo painter. She was not an oil painter trained at the Royal Academy in France, but a pastel artist with unknown training from Italy. And she was a she, a female artist who became one of the most sought after portraitists of her time, male or female, in Europe. Rosalba Giovanna Carrera was born January 12, 1673, in Venice and despite all obstacles, as I said, rose to become one of the most successful female artists not only of her own time, but perhaps even through today. The first obstacle she faced would be training. In fact, it may be that young Rosalba would have never dreamed of becoming a great artist, for unlike the majority of women painters from the Renaissance through the modern period, most female artists were the daughters of artists and had received their initial training from their fathers. In Rosalba's case, she came from what is sometimes described as humble origins. Her father was not an artist, but a Venetian lawyer, sometimes described as a clerk. Her mother was a popular lace maker, a trade in which Rosalba and her two younger sisters would also be trained in in order to help financially support their family. It is said that Rosalba would draw the lace patterns for her mother, and that might have been the earliest signs of her artistic training and prowess. While her paternal grandfather was a minor painter, there is no real evidence of his influence. And there were a few other local Venetian artists, of course, it's Venice, but there is no real evidence of whom she may have trained with. So there remains a mystery as to where she learned the foundation of her artistic skills. So let's turn to what we do know. Her decision to become a painter may have initially been based on necessity and talent as much as anything else. As the trend for lace became less fashionable, it simply became necessary for young Rosalba to look elsewhere for financial support. From making lace, she turned to decorating fashionable accessories, such as painting the lids of snuff boxes, largely for tourists passing through Venice. She painted designs and decoration, and then miniature portraits on the lids of these small boxes. During this time, Rosalba seems to have been continually refining her talent and experimenting with her techniques of painting that would later translate to her techniques in chalk pastel. A quick note, miniature painting in the forms of limnings or quote-unquote little pictures as opposed to miniature paintings of illuminated manuscripts first became popular in the 16th century of the Renaissance and then increasingly common during the 17th and 18th century. These portraits were like keepsakes little pictures of your loved ones, sometimes worn as accessories or jewelry, and sometimes a little more privately kept if those loved ones immortalized in portraiture were meant to be a little less advertised, if you catch my meaning. By the turn of the 18th century, Rosalba had become quite popular for her skills as a miniaturist, and by 1705, she is elected as an honorary member of the prestigious Academy of St. Luke in Rome as a miniature painter, with the reception piece in her typical style of painting on ivory. And this is where we find one of the early innovations by Rosalba. Although these tiny portraits were traditionally painted on vellum, Rosalba is credited as being the first to paint these portraits on ivory, incorporating the translucent glow of the material with the figures and their attire. However, it is not her innovations in miniature painting that Rosalba Carrera is best known today, but rather her pastel portraits. Her interest in chalk pastels is sometimes credited as beginning with a gift of pastels from a patron of her work. Additionally, a series of letters between her and several contacts from beyond Venice reveal that she was quite interested in the medium of chalk pastels and ever in search of better quality than she could find in Venice. Within a few years, by about 1708, she had largely traded in her paints for chalk pastels, which becomes her primary medium from here on out. Seen here is a portrait of Rosalba Carrera holding a portrait, which I've heard described as both a self-portrait or as a portrait of her younger sister. The fact that she and her younger sister both shared the same name, Rosalba Giovanna Carrera, might have contributed to the confusion of this attribution. Thankfully, the parents got a little more creative for the birth of the third and youngest daughter, whose name was Angela Cecilia. We see something pretty interesting going on in this double portrait by Rosalba, naturalism and idealism. 
In the main self-portrait, she is depicted rather matter-of-fact. She doesn't seem to be giving herself the same idealized treatment she is known for bestowing upon her patrons. When we look at the smaller portrait, whether of herself or her sister, we see the more recognizable style of the artist in which the sitter appears quite lovely. And this is true of the vast majority of Carrera's portraits. Flawless skin, flowing hair, beautiful clothing. While they are recognizable as distinct individuals, they are also quite flattering. What we might think of as being photoshopped today. When we look at this contrast, it is almost like she's saying, this is what I or you might really look like, but this is what I can make you look like. Maybe, maybe not. One last note before we move on. Just take a look at that beautiful lace worn in both portraits seen here. Close up, there's a slight sense of gesture and even abstraction, and yet she is still able to create a sense of the delicacy of the lace against the other fabrics. This is perhaps a reminder of her background and expertise with this material. So from here, we're gonna fast forward a little bit to the late 17 teens. Rosaba was now among the must stop artist studios for those taking the grand tour or simply visiting Venice. And this leads to an important invitation from the French patron of all things Rococo, Pierre Crozat. Crozat invites Rosaba Carrera to join him at his estate in Paris, where, by the way, the famous French painter Watteau also stayed for quite some time and enjoyed the lively gatherings known as salons, one of which we see here, complete with musicians and a room full of guests, painted by Watteau in about 1720, possibly just after he returned from England to rejoin his patron. So Rosaba sets out, but it would be quite improper for a woman to travel alone, so she is accompanied with a small retinue, including her close friend Anton Zanetti, her mother, her two younger sisters, and brother-in-law. They all travel together to Paris, and Rosaba, of course, becomes an instant success. Here she paints, and it's worth noting that they would call them paintings, even though today we might think of them as drawings in the medium of chalk pastel, portraits of the young king to be, Louis XV at the age of 10, as well as a more somber toned portrayal of Watteau, who was at that time suffering the effects of tuberculosis from which he would die the following year. We can look at these two portraits, and although they are quite distinct, we still see some trademarks of her style. One recognizable technique was to lay down a dark tone and then for highlights, lay a pastel on its side and drag it lightly across the surface. She had innovated this in her painted portraits in which she used the side of her brush as a means to overlay light color over a darker surface. This helps to create a sense of the highlight in the sitter's hair, the attire, and of course, that beautiful lace. Next, we might look at how the figures are seated. While the famous Rococo painter Watteau is known to have sketched figures in a wide variety of postures, and then he would refer back to them and kind of assemble these pre-drawn sketches together for his famous Fête Galant paintings, like the one seen here, Rosalba, now dressed as an allegory of winter, had a pretty recognizable variety of poses for her clients throughout her career. The vast majority of her known works are bust portraits, in which we see the upper torso either facing the viewer or angled slightly away, sometimes even in profile, but always with enough of the figure to display the exquisite embroidery, lavish silks, and again that delicate lace, beautiful clothing. The face of the sitter always looks back out to the viewer. The size of the pastel portraits was limited due both to the material itself and the need to protect the drawings under thin panes of glass. These were not commercially available in the wide ranges of sizes we have today, and thus were also a limiting factor. However, within those constraints, as you can clearly see, she portrays a wide assortment of personalities, some actual portraits, others as allegories, both of which were quite popular at the time. A measure of her success among the first portraits she created in Paris was this image we viewed earlier, a young King Louis XV at the tender age of 10. Turning now to the depiction of Watteau, what we see here is also a little more somber than what we typically see in the lively Rococo portraits by Carrera. And it is hard not to look at this portrait today 
knowing that Watteau was ill and not long for this world, without reading it somewhat as a memorial for the great artist. What we might not recognize today in these portraits is that the clothing may or may not be the typical contemporary attire of the time it was painted. For example, this gentleman wears a beautiful blue jacket with lavish embroidery. He is holding a long staff and wears a short black cape, for lack of a better word, and a smart black hat. Looking at this portrait in 2021, we might think, ah, that's typical for how the aristocracy dressed in the 18th century. But this is not typical. This is believed to be an example of a costume provided by the artist, as the long staff and short cape were the attire of a pilgrim. This appears in a few different portraits by Rosalba Carriera, and it might also remind you of something you have seen in the famous Fetgalant painting, Pilgrimage to Cythera, by our friend Watteau. Look closely and you'll see numerous figures in Watteau's paintings wearing a similar cape and holding a long staff. This is to denote the idea of a pilgrim, as the black capes would have been worn and ultimately decorated with the symbols of the sacred destinations reached by the traveling pilgrim. No symbol here. This motif in both Carriera's and Bato's paintings are often described as pilgrims of love, reflecting the flirtatious themes common in the Rococo period. During her stay in France, Rosalba was elected to the French Royal Academy, an honor bestowed on less than 10 women since the Academy's founding in 1648. This achievement is even more remarkable when we learn that about two decades prior to Rosalba's stay in France, the Royal Academy had officially banned women from becoming members altogether. Her admittance by a unanimous vote is a sign both of her popularity and also a reflection of the more liberal years of the Regency following the death of King Louis XIV in 1715. After a successful year in Paris, Rosalba returned to Venice to her home on the Grand Canal in 1721. She would remain largely in her hometown for nearly a decade before traveling again, this time to Vienna, where Charles VI was her patron and Empress Elizabeth her pupil. Before concluding, I shouldn't forget to mention that also among her royal patrons were the King of Denmark during his visit to Vienna in 1709, and perhaps most notably, King Augustus III of Poland, who was a great collector and acquired about 150 works created by the artist, which are now part of the Altmeister Gallery in Dresden. Sadly, Carriera's final years were not happy ones. Her eyesight grew increasingly worse until she finally lost her vision in 1746. She had lost her sister Giovanna nearly a decade earlier, and her final years, though relatively comfortable financially due to her earlier success, are described as filled with bouts of depression. She died in Vienna in 1757 at the age of 84. A final portrait shows her as the allegorical figure of winter. In this, her regal attire suggests that she is fully aware of her position as a reigning figure in the cultural period we now call Rococo. However, not long after her death, the Rococo style was beginning to face new challenges with the rising concern for a greater seriousness of purpose to be met in the arts, and that would be satisfied with the return of the true style of classicism, what we now call neoclassicism. In this changing of the artistic guards, so to speak, many of the earlier dominant artists of the 18th century, now associated with the Rococo, would be nearly forgotten. Fortunately, Rosalba's letters and diary entries were preserved, as was a great deal of her work that remained in museum bequests or royal collections. That said, Rosalba's name remains slightly overlooked in comparison with her French peers, many of whom were also admirers of her innovative style as well as her work with pastels introduced to France in the early years of the Rococo. This was no doubt influential to both the palette and luxurious style that characterizes the Rococo. Over time, her name has made its way back into the lexicon of art history, where it does indeed deserve equal credit to those of her patrons, peers, and admirers. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time on Art History Talks.